Awesome. Uh, Aaron, thanks so much for joining me on the next episode of the SaaS Sales Performance Podcast. Aaron, I remember going for a run down by the Thames back last year and actually listening to you on the Victor Antonio podcast. So that's when I first got to know about you. And it was quite unusual hearing an English accent on that podcast because, you know, so much of the the content that we listen to as the sales industry is US focused. It was really refreshing to hear a guy with a British accent. I've been following your content ever since. I mean, for those who are listening to this and haven't come across you yet, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about your story and how you came into to sales enablement. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I've been in sales enablement since what I like to say is it was before it was called sales enablement, right? So I worked for a huge multinational publishing house about, what, 14 years ago now. And I was actually selling for a very small amount of time before they moved me into a coaching function because they realized that I was coaching and training quite well. And then it grew out and grew out and grew out until they paid for me to get all my qualifications, all of my, you know, certification to basically do sales enablement, right? And since then, I've worked for large multinational corporates right down to small startups. As the pinnacle of this was when I actually IPO'd an organization in Australia in 2014. But yeah, I mean... I've been living and breathing sales enablement, learning about sales enablement for the last 14 years, both large and small organizations. It's been a very, very exciting journey. Very exciting. We were talking off air before we jumped on, Aaron, around how you know relatively new sales enablement is as a term. And you mentioned in a previous conversation we had that it wasn't even called that when you started doing this stuff, right? From my experience so far in working with clients in this space, it feels like the kind of key elements of sales enablement are... I guess, content, making sure that reps have the right content at the right time, training and coaching, then a massive part of sales enablement, and I guess technology. Is there anything I'm, I'm kind of missing there? And, and how would you encourage, you know, sales leaders and people within the industry to think about sales enablement? Sadly, it's quite a lot you're missing, mate. I wish my job was that simple, but no, it's, it's actually <laughs> tons, right? So the way I articulate it is basically, think of it as like 12 pillars of sales excellence, right? So you've got, starting at the very beginning, sales competencies. What defines a good rep at what level and what job function, right? Then you've got talent selection. How do we then go and find that right candidate that has all the competencies we need to do the job effectively? Then there's onboarding. So then you find that talent, you've identified the right talent, you onboard them to set them up success. So, so hiring for value, skills, attitude, and potential. And then there's the KPIs. So how do we now measure that individual to make sure that they're driving the right results, leading and lagging indicators to ultimately achieve the overarching business goals. Then there's sales content, which you mentioned, educational material aligned to the buyer stages, sales training, again, you mentioned consultative core skills and methodologies, sales coaching, which is a massive part of sales enablement, where I spend a large part of my job, embedding long lasting behavioral change. And there's sales management mentorship, so making sure that sales managers are coaching the coach, sorry, you're coaching the coach and the sales managers are executing on those important things the business needs them to do and then you've got the process and enablement side of it which is deal qualification sales process sales technology and, and obviously sales intelligence as well so when you look at those 12 pillars what you're really talking about here is a conduit between many different functions within a business so strategy feed their strategy into sales enablement to ultimately impart on the sales organization product product marketing marketing you know, every part of the business almost needs to be funneled through sales enablement to get to sales with the right message, the right behaviors, the right standards, and ultimately the right execution. Yeah, that's a really helpful overview. And there's, I guess it feels like this year in particular, with, with in amidst the pandemic, sales enablement is just growing as a, a, a more and more of a strategic priority for so many of the sales leaders I'm talking to. One thing that, that, that comes up, and we'll come on to talk about the, the coaching and development side in just a moment, Aaron, is where, does, where should sales enablement sit? Because, I mean, a lot of younger companies who, who perhaps don't have any training and development places as a sales org, you know, quite often I've seen them leaning on like central learning and development teams. You know, so do you quite often see a bit of a disjointed approach in the early stages where training and development is kind of led by learning and development but then you've got sales ops guys running the kind of uh, technology side I, I mean how have you seen it done best and where do you think sales enablement should, should sit within an organization it's a really good question actually i think this is where a lot of organizations make mistakes is that they kind of bundle it in with the sales organization well there needs to be a degree of impartiality in the sales enablement function to make sure that it can completely objectively look at something and say this is the improvement that's needed. Now, in my experience, and I think the market is 
is also echoing this is that sales enablement needs to move higher up the organization because so many different departments, as I mentioned before, are being funneled through sales enablement. It's almost a strategic function. So, and the point you've made there about COVID-19, like shining a light on sales enablement is really important. Ultimately, it's because organizations have pivoted, right? They've pivoted from working in an office to now working at home. They've pivoted in their value proposition. So we can't now do this because of COVID. We need to do something different. How do we get the value proposition articulated correctly to the salespeople with all the right content and the right systems and processes to make sure they're doing it right? So to maximize the effect of sales enablement, it should sit at the very top of the organization, almost aligned to strategy, because that's ultimately what it's doing. It's executing on strategic objectives, changes within the organization, any, any nimble pivoting that's going on needs to come through sales enablement. And the higher up the organization you can get it, the more effective it's going to be. I mean, in the, the organization I work for, Global Data, we sit in strategy, which makes complete sense because the change has to come through us to be imparted on the sales organization. Really, really interesting. Really interesting. Um, what do you think the role is of, of managers within that? I mean, obviously, one thing that I'm seeing is, you know, if, if sales enablement are the ones leading the strategic change, there's then got to be a massive role for the boots on the ground to actually implement that change, right? How are you thinking about a common blocker that I'm seeing is, is actually how, how, do you, how do you really get the managerial, you know, sales managers in your organization bought into what you're trying to do from a sales enablement perspective? Any, any tips you can share on, on that? Yeah, plenty. I mean, look, the, the first way you've got to look at it is that the sales management is your internal customer as a sales enablement function, right? So they are one of your customers and customers can be difficult as we all know, right? But yeah, I think the way that it's positioned within a business sometimes can be, can create a lot of sort of anxious behaviors for sales managers, because there's a large part of your job, their job that you're actually absorbing in a way, not, not day to day, but certainly you're telling them what needs to be done, how it needs to be articulated, how to police it at a local level. So there's two ways you can look at that. You can look at it as sort of stepping on their toes, but what great sales enablement functions do is they look at it as a way of working with the sales managers to ultimately take more off their plate and create best practice that's scalable, that's centralized, ultimately driving the right results for the business. So it all starts with the why, with any change. If you're making a change within a business, if you're not crisply and clearly articulating the why that change is being made, in the same way that a salesperson would, you know, like if you're selling something to someone, you've got to explain how it's going to make their life easier or better or more productive or generate better results. So what happens in a business is big change is made, it trickles down to sales management and sales management go, right, we've got to make this change. Sorry, guys, not my fault. And then they start executing on this change. Whereas what sales enablement can do really effectively is actually educate the sales management on why this change is so important and what the landscape's going to look like over the next year, two years, and how it's going to actually help them and enable. Now, in sales enablement, that is also sales management that you're helping with. And like one of the pillars I mentioned before was sales management mentoring and, 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 and training. So your objective within sales enablement isn't just to get the, the very bottom of the organization or the coal face better at the job. It's actually about to get sales managers better at their job as well. So you become a resource for them to use as well. So to how to get better at management disciplines, how to get better at, you know, things from interviewing right through to um, conflict resolution and, and performance management. So the two things there, if we sum it up, is that help the sales manager go on that journey with you and explain the why this change is happening and ultimately the benefits. And second of all, they're an internal customer. So make sure that you're servicing them as well as you would service the end user or the, or the cold face or a salesperson individually. It sounds like there's an element of storytelling that's required there, you know, much like you would do with with a client as you're bringing them on the journey of the project that you're working on together. I, I've been I've been there myself, you know, when you first move into a managerial position, you know, you've come from an IC role, you're kind of thrown in with <laughs> with no training, you know, and then you're left to figure out, okay, now I have to become a manager, I have to figure out how to coach, how to lead. Sometimes these sales enablement initiatives can, as a manager, feel like extra work. Is it by using that storytelling approach that you articulate the value to the managers? in and are then able to overcome that that hurdle when working with managers yeah that's one part of it right and obviously storytelling is 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 critical when you're selling any idea or selling any thing that you need from someone or want want from them be it money or ultimately to execute on a strategy but i think where all a lot of organizations go wrong is actually peeling away the layers of what the management function is designed to do right and there's four fundamental things sales managers are supposed to be doing right Number one is they're supposed to be making their rep better than they were at the job yesterday. 
That's the primary function of a manager is to improve your people every single day. Okay? Number two is to articulate the overarching business objectives. So the sales function is excited, motivated, interested in working for your business. Yeah, that, that's a core function of the role. Number three is to create an environment locally. So within your team where the sales function or the sales people want to get out of bed every morning, feel valued and ultimately are excited about executing on tasks and, 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 and doing their job, right? The last one is they need to report on it. That's the last one. But where do you think sales managers spend most of their time? The reporting part. Reporting and admin, yeah. So we're actually completely abstracting what a sales manager should be doing. Um, now, the point of a sales enablement function is actually to concentrate on those first three things. We do help with the fourth part, but we're designed to automate that fourth part. So it's not like you constantly building reports for, for senior people who can just drag it from the CRM. I always say, look, if you're spending most of your day reporting, it's not you that's broken, it's the CRM that's broken. If your manager can't click a button and get all the, everything they need, and they rely on you to do it manually, then it's actually a process and a process automation problem. And it's eating into your job of doing those other three things which are core to the role. One thing that I've been talking with sales leaders about a lot in terms of making the case for working together from a UHOPS perspective is, is manager time. So how can we actually free up manager time when it comes to things like PDP, planning, scheduling of one-to-ones, figuring out what you're going to actually cover in a one-to-one? You know, how can we just take away that, uh, that, that time commitment from the manager's perspective? Because mm -hmm. as you say, that manager time is, is so valuable, right? Yeah, and look, again, it's you, most of the stuff that managers do could be cleared up, right? Now, technology is so important in that, like a sales enablement tech stack is critical. Like coaching by using a conversation intelligence tool strips away hours during the course of the day, right? That's true. Like a decent CRM means that when you're running pipeline reviews or forecasting, all the work's done for you, so it's process and process automation. Um, now, you can solve that for a tech stack and spending a lot of money, but one thing that sales enablement can do is look internally at the resources they have to help build that out as well. So it might be a plaster or something that's just going to fix the problem immediately, but it's designed to make the process, first of all, in line with what the business needs to do, but second of all, easier for the manager as well. And I think if you speak to any manager and say to them, look, good news, we're going to take almost all the reporting away from you, I'd be very surprised if they weren't happy. <laughs> very, very surprised. And that gives them that time back to do the important stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Aaron, thinking about that, the, the coaching and development side then, you know, and, and, and thinking specifically about that manager layer, a lot of the clients that I'm speaking to at the moment, your sales leaders, you know, VPs of sales, chief revenue officers of fast growth businesses, at the moment, for a lot of them, all roads still kind of lead to them. They're now figuring how they take their teams from, let's say, 10 to 15 reps to 20, 25, 30 plus reps. And they're suddenly realizing that, holy shit, I can't be responsible for one-to-ones with everyone. I need to now put in place this management layer. I need to equip them with the right tools to do the coaching effectively. I mean, for clients at that stage, what would your advice be in terms of thinking about getting coaching and development within sales enablement right from the get-go? Well, it's not just the coaching part they need to get right from the get-go, right? It's like baking a cake, getting for the process of actually mixing all the ingredients and then realizing, oh shit, my tin's too big or my tin's too small. You can't go back and undo it, right? So far too many business owners plan for their first layer of growth. So they go, right, you know, we're growing to this amount. What you're better off doing is putting in places, putting in systems and processes that can be scaled as the business grows from day one. Um, and it's such a blind spot for entrepreneurs and it's such a blind spot for growing businesses is that they, they're too myopic in this view. They look at the next layer of growth. But every time you go for that next layer of growth, you're going back and undoing all the processes and the systems you've built to accommodate that next layer of growth. What you're better doing is getting everything right from day one. Sales process, sales methodology, qualification process, coaching cadence, management capability. And you can do it on the same budget. You just spend more time planning to get it right. Um, so I'd say that, it, again, it's, it's, having a, it's having a broader view of your organization, right? Um, if you think about the growth trajectory of a business, you know, the first customer is your first big event. Like you've got a product and you've now got your first customer. Well, the way you service that customer from day one 
and the way that you've won that customer search from day one should be the same processes, systems, and, and ultimately habits as you, if you were doing it with a million customers that are coming into your business, because you're creating the sausage machine as opposed to 25% of the sausage, or then 50% of the sausage, or then 100% of the sausage. Does that make sense? This idea of designing mm. things scalable from day one, so you don't have to go back and unpick everything that you've done. Making sure you've got the right size cake tin for the mixture that you're putting into it. Exactly right. Yeah. To use a, a cooking analogy, which I love. I love that. So in terms of t- to, to make that 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 practical, Aaron, it's about being really clear on what your sales process is, being really clear on what value you need to deliver across your sales uh, process, and then being really clear on f- what you've been providing in terms of resources, coaching, and support for those salespeople in the early days, and then putting in place the processes, technology, and coaching that that scale as the team scales. Yeah, I mean, like coaching is great, but you've got to coach around something, right? And the best thing to coach around are these three things. Deal qualification, so a good, strong qualification methodology. Sales process, a clear sales, a guided sales process that leads the buyer and the salesperson to constantly move in the right direction. And then methodology, sales methodology. How do you do it well? How do you do it to the right standard? If you bring all those three things together, which are often conflated, people often think a sales process is a qualification methodology or that a sales methodology is a sales process. They're not, they're all intrinsically different. Now that becomes the bedrock of what you're coaching around. So when a deal is at a certain stage of a sales process, you're coaching around that. You're not just going, right, what do you want to improve on? Questioning, great, let's coach. It's like, well, there's not going to be strong outcomes at the back of that. And it's not really consistent with what the business is trying to achieve. So if you get those three things in place, then you've got a really solid bedrock to actually grow the business. Three amazing tips there to, to finish up on. Aaron, I, I could talk here all day about some of these topics and I've loved the, the the overview and insights that you shared with us there. I know there's so much amazing content on your YouTube channel, so I want to make sure that we give that a shout out. I mean, where can people continue to hear from you, continue to, to learn from you in the sales enablement space? Sure, so LinkedIn's a really good place. So if you, if you come and follow me on LinkedIn, it's just Aaron Evans. But I do have a YouTube channel where I give away all of my insight, content, experience for free. Aaron Evans Sales Training on YouTube. Amazing. Aaron, it's been such a, a pleasure catching up with you today and uh, look forward to, to doing it again really soon. Thanks for having me. Cheers.